Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is uh, Tony Addison from uh, UNU Wider and uh, the University of Copenhagen, uh, welcoming you to this uh, webinar. Um, and uh, we are just um, letting people into the uh, meeting at the moment. I think we have a very good audience today. This uh, video is part of our um, program on um, domestic uh, resource uh, mobilization, which is a, a UNU wider research project uh, supported by uh, the government of Norway through uh, NORAD. And today we thought we would have um, some presentations on um, what we're seeing in the, uh, the lead up to um, the climate change meetings shortly to take place in um, Egypt. Uh, we've had a series of meetings at WIDER, including a, a round table a, a couple of weeks back, discussing the issues, particularly focusing on the energy issues, and particularly uh, focusing on the, um, the oil and gas sector, which is going to be um, uh, very much the topic um, today. As we said on the introductory slide, uh, we'll be videoing this meeting, so you'll be able to watch it on the WIDER YouTube channel uh, later on. There is the normal uh, chat function uh, in which you can uh, make some comments or um, ask some questions. Uh, we, we only have an hour today for the webinar, so we're going to have to proceed uh, relatively uh, smartly. So we'll, we'll see whether we can get to um, some uh, chat or uh, Q&A later on, but um, uh, we'll have to give prominence to the presenters today, given it's a, an hour long, um, long webinar. Our um, speakers today uh, will be beginning with um, Catherine McPhail and Etienne Ronson of um, uh, Energy CC, which is a, a group with very long standing experience in the energy uh, business, advising companies, governments, uh, and others uh, with extensive uh, experience in this particular field of work. And they've been um, uh, working with WIDER on uh, issues particularly to do with uh, oil and gas and reducing emissions in the oil and gas sector, which I'll be talking about today, uh, but also issues of oil theft as well. And those papers are on the website. They have actually prepared um, a paper, a draft paper, which will eventually come out as a wider working paper, which discusses um, some of the important energy issues leading up to uh, the COP meetings. And that's actually on the website uh, of this um, meeting for you to uh, download. The presentation by um, Catherine and Etienne will be then um, followed by uh, Mahmoud uh, Mahildin, who is uh, one of the UN climate change high level champions for the forthcoming COP27. Uh, Very familiar to you all, uh, being extensively involved with the UN through uh, being a special envoy on uh, financing and the sustainable development uh, agenda. Uh, Mahmoud, as you appreciate, is extremely busy in the lead up to the uh, meeting, so we'll be very grateful uh, to have him in this meeting, and he'll be coming into this session uh, later on. So without further ado, uh, if Etienne could put up um, the first slide, that would be, uh, that would be helpful on the share screen using this wonderful Zoom technology that we've all got so familiar with over the last um, two years. And uh, this uh, first slide before Etienne makes the presentation, Etienne and Catherine make the presentation, just shows some of the multiple challenges that we face at the moment. We are in a sense in a triple challenge. Um, We've needing to improve resilience for health, particularly as we recover from the COVID pandemic. Um, air quality, which is directly connected to emissions, is also part of the health agenda. We're all engaged in trying to improve um, energy security, particularly in the development context, because we know there's so much energy poverty in the developing world. And we're all, all trying to improve economic growth, but growth that's sustainable uh, environmentally and reduces poverty. And I don't need to remind the audience here today of the multiple challenges that we face 
with that agenda, recession, post-conflict recovery, and of course, the war in uh, Ukraine. And at the center of that is, of course, the substance of the COP27 meeting, how we are going to accelerate progress on reducing carbon and methane and other greenhouse gas emissions, which is going to be the focus of um, uh, Etienne and uh, Catherine's um, discussion. So let me now uh, leave, leave the floor to uh, Etienne and Catherine from Energy CC to make their presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Tony. And um, first of all, I'd like to say to all the distinguished participants, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you all for joining. And we really look forward to your participation. And before I get started, I'd also like to thank Tony Addison and UNU Wider really for the leadership on how reducing wasted gas emissions presents immediate opportunities to create cleaner air and reduce climate impacts. We are really also delighted that many people who joined a round table that Tony chaired in September on this topic are also with us again today. And this really brings together the strat line of COP27, which is together for implementation. So next slide, please. So Tony has already set out some of the global challenges. And what we observe is that solutions to these global challenges are often approached in separate silos. So we see a real opportunity to tackle these issues that Tony raised in a more coordinated way through gas flaring and venting. So there's two messages that we'll be setting out in the course of our presentation. The first is that reducing emissions creates benefits that extend well beyond climate. Policymakers now have visibility of the multiple benefits simultaneously for human health, for food security, for public revenues, for energy efficiency, and for climate. And more broadly, wider research shows that there are a large number of developing countries which are dependent on oil and gas production. The World Bank finds that much of the wasted gas occurs in developing countries. And our second message today is that solutions exist to reduce these emissions. We know where the emitters are, we know how much they emit, we know the cost of these emissions in financial, economic, and importantly, in social terms. Some of these solutions are already being pioneered in developing countries, and there are also immediate opportunities to scale up action. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Now, many of you will have seen the 2022 Sustainable Development Report, which finds that for the second year in a row, the world is no longer making progress on the UN SDGs. So there's two messages from this slide. First of all, the volume of global gas flared and vented is very large. 7.5% of global gas is wasted, and at current prices, about $10 per mm BTU. This has a gas sales value of 100 billion US dollars per year. But more importantly, and as you can see from the chart on the right hand side of the, the screen here, this 7.5% of global gas flared and vented actually causes. 54% of the total social cost of global natural gas produced and used. And if we go to the next slide, we can see this in a bit more detail. So here we are setting out this, what we call the social cost of atmospheric release. This is based on a model that I don't have time to go into today, but we have being able to quantify using this model in dollar terms, this scar as it's called on human health, agricultural yields and climate. 
Now on the left hand side, you will see the social cost of eight different atmospheric releases, starting from methane, CH4 at the top, down to carbon at the bottom. Now there's two points I want to talk about in terms of results here. First of all, different emissions affect climate, air quality, health and agriculture in different ways. The second is methane. If you take a look at the top bar chart, which says methane CH4, it has a disproportionately large impact on human health. The light green that you see is the health impacts from air quality. WHO finds that air pollution is the leading environmental health risk that humans face from premature deaths. The dark green bar is the health impact from climate changes. So this would include diseases such as malaria and dengue. And WHO also finds that of the 4 million premature deaths in 2016, 91% occurred in developing countries. So I think the lesson for policymakers is really we see an immediate benefit to many sustainable development goals by reducing methane and other atmospheric emissions from gas flaring and venting. So let's look a little more detail at the large local benefit. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this slide is a satellite image, Southeast Asia, you can see on the left, focusing in on Indonesia and Jambi city, which is a pretty large city in Sumatra. But you can see from this satellite image how there are many houses within a very short radius of this flare, which is in the center. This also includes food stores and coffee shops. Now, Jambi City is short of electric power. So this wasted flare gas could be monetized for local power generation put into the grid. And we'll talk more about gas monetization later on. And there's a lesson here for policymakers because the satellite data also shows that Indonesia has 200 gas flares. So it highlights the opportunities for energy access and importantly for clean air as championed by Clean Air Asia, which is an international NGO that has been working for several decades on air quality. So if we go to the next slide, please. This next slide is, come, takes us to Nigeria. And we are in the Niger Delta here. You can see the location on the left-hand side of this flare. And on the right, there's, an, there's the, um, ex, ex, not exaggerated, but an expanded uh, view of the slide. And what is striking about this particular vision from the satellites, is how the agricultural fields are actually right on the boundary of this large flare from an oil and gas facility in Ogbe village. Now this creates a lot of health risks. I mean, I've talked about methane, but VOCs, volatile organic compounds are carcinogenic. There's a lot of cancer risks. So again, there's, there's a lot of risk and a lot of opportunity from reducing these emissions. Next slide, please. So here I want to speak specifically about super emitters. So when we were so pleased to see at COP26, the Global Methane Pledge, such a great success, and now signed by 120 countries or more, so we were thinking about, well, what could we do to support this pledge? And we were very struck by a comment in the documents about how it was going to particularly focus on high emission sources. Now we know from satellite data that more than 60% of all gas flared comes from just 700 flares out of a total of 10,800. So if you look, to the right of this slide, you'll see the figures there. So this really helps to highlight how if we target the largest flares, this would yield major reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So a top super emitters list, which combines both the flaring that I'm talking about here, 
Importantly, with methane emissions, this will go a long way to benefit policymakers, operators, investors, and local communities in ways that are set out on the slide. I won't read them out. But importantly, many of these global super emitters are in only a few countries. Again, many developing countries. So almost all these countries, however, are members of organizations or MDBs that have already pledged technical assistance and project support for the Global Methane Pledge, including the EBRD and the Green Climate Fund. So let me go to my last slide before we hand into Etienne. So the last slide is actually an extract taken from a Center for Global Development blog. Uh, Center for Global Development is based in Washington, DC. And I believe there's some participation by CGD in this webinar. So this again sets out some key actors if we are going to accelerate implementation. But what I'm going to focus on is the third point <clears throat> regarding the IMF. Now the IMF is a unique institution in that it holds mandatory Article 4 consultations with all 190 member countries. It's been playing a leadership role since the Paris Climate Agreement, including in its analytical work. And this work also includes a proposal that methane penalties are based on a deemed basis, as they call it. So this would mean that the government does not have to prove how much methane is emitted, but rebates would be given to operators that prove themselves through independent assessment, such as satellite monitoring, that they emitted less. And very encouraging, just last week at the annual meetings, the IMF announced that its new Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which is focused on pandemics and climate, has become operational and is ready to start lending operations. So here again is a pathway towards linking finance to methane and other atmospheric emissions reduction. So let me stop there and I'm going to hand over to Etienne to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Catherine, for, for that uh, uh, introduction and summary. Um, what we've heard is that um, flaring and venting emissions are, are large, $100 billion annually in sales value. They're harmful for local health for regional agriculture and for global climate. And the emissions from blaring and venting cause, cause more than half of the total social cost from all use of natural gas. So there's an urgent need to reduce these avoidable emissions. So the question really is, why does routine flaring and venting persist when the benefits for not doing so are so large? When we study specific cases of emitters, we know that solutions often readily exist, as Catherine already mentioned. But these solutions require not one, but a combination of actions and actors, a multidimensional approach. And this is highlighted in the diamond model that you see on the screen on the right. Each of the four quadrants of this model brings a part of the solution to reduce emissions, and each element works in concert with the other elements. Measurement of emissions enables useful actions towards emitters. Even if emissions are measured, this information is often not available to the right parties to take action, whether these are regulators, local community governments, or NGOs. Transparency is key for decision useful information on repurposing the gas wasted. Gas monetization technologies exist. Um, and are now much more easy to deploy and more commercial to implement. But these solutions require regulatory support for gas aggregation, for third party in infrastructure access, uh, for lifting of import restrictions so that these technologies can be imported, 
and meaningful penalties that can induce the oil and gas operators to implement emission reduction measures. In the next part, I will highlight each of the elements of the diver model in a little bit more detail. We work a lot with satellite measurements of emissions. Multiple satellites scan the whole planet on a daily basis and measure a range of things. And here's a data set from one super emitter flare that we evaluated in Nigeria, all from the comfort from our office in Singapore. These, there are some 11,000 gas flares on the planet, as Catherine already mentioned, and each one can be individually identified by its spectral signature and by and its rate measured by the light it emits. With multiple readings per day, if there's no cloud cover at least, a substantial data set builds up over a period of time. In this example, flare observations uh, span 10 years and each rate measured is a little red, uh, yellow dot in the graph on the right. Some 4,000 measurements in total for this single flare. This provides very valuable information to trend flare rate performance and benchmark rates with other assets. And with further spatial information, such as from Google Maps, it then becomes possible to study and screen potential opportunities for repurposing this gas being wasted, whether for local power generation or to be used as an automotive fuel, as, as compressed natural gas, or for gas aggregation and export. What is remarkable is that this particular uh, Obiafu Obicom gas plant flare is connected by a pipeline to the Borny liquefied natural gas plant, LNG plant. And thus the gas could be exported at a time when the LNG plant operates at less than 70% of its capacity and more natural gas is desperately needed globally. It is intriguing therefore why this gas plant ranks as one of the top 1% largest gas flares on the planet. The evaluation of the Obiafu Obicom gas flare is one out of a portfolio of 62 flares we evaluated for Oxford policy management under the Foster project by UK's FCDO. Nigeria actually has a good track record in reducing gas flaring from 21 billion cubic meters in 2005 to 7 billion cubic meters in 2020. However, significant opportunities to reduce flaring remain. Of the population of 62 flares we studied, these are located onshore in the northern, northern Niger, Niger Delta and represent one third of the total gas flare flared by Nigeria. The gas flared by these amounts to one and a half million tons per annum of LNG output with a market value of 730 million US dollars a year. And as I mentioned, much of this gas flared is already connected by a pipeline to the Bonny LNG plant. Other flares only require short distance tie-ins to this existing infrastructure. The scale of gas flare in Nigeria and many other countries offers highly significant opportunities to increase fiscal value for governments and energy security for Europe. Bonny LNG provides half its LNG output to European markets. In addition to highlighting the scale of the opportunity to repurpose gas being flared, the OPM project also revealed another key aspect. Government is often missing decision useful information they need to set the right policy. In Nigeria, there are flaring penalties that are only a quarter of the amount for marginal oil producers. Producers that produce less than 10,000 barrels a day. However, our study found that three of the four global super emitters in the northern, northern Niger Delta are actually marginal oil producers. So the assumption that small producers flare less and therefore should attract a lower level penalty simply does not hold. Finally, satellite data can also assist regulators to prioritize where to focus their attention and which assets to visit for inspection and follow-up. The transparency that satellite data can provide on emissions is therefore very useful for governments and regulators, but there's another way how data transparency can help. With information available for each global gas flare on its location and rate, it is possible to develop a super emitter top 100 or top 200 list. We are currently looking at the opportunity 
to super impose methane emissions for each of the global flare super emitters. Flare combusts natural gas imperfectly and sometimes can actually do more damage than just gas venting. The project that we wish to execute will draw attention not only to how much gas is wasted, but also to flare quality and therefore the social impact on health. In our wider research, we have documented the chemicals emitted from flaring and their impact. Catherine already showed the summary slide on this. There is abundant evidence that vol volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and black carbon emissions, among other chemicals emitted by flaring, are carcinogenic. I also refer to a recent reporting by the BBC on the impact of gas flaring uh, at Basra oil fields and the links to cancer such as leukemia. In BBC's latest hard talk program yesterday, the issue was acknowledged by the Iraqi environmental minister. We have the ability to create a global top 200 super emitter list such that efforts can focus on addressing the disproportionate harm this relatively small group of individual emitters has on society. In the graph above is shown the largest global flare in 2020, indeed located in Iraq, in a field operated by Lukoil. The top 100 gas flares are shown on the right. The gas wasted by this single flare on the left provides sufficient fuel for more than 92,000 commercial vehicles if they would be running on compressed natural gas. The black smoke visible in the Google image on the left bottom is indicative of the harmful chemicals being spewed out and as reported by the BBC. Iraq flares enough gas to, to be able to support a very large LNG plant, but not only that. Kuwait is next door to Iraq and is importing natural gas with expensive LNG. It is less than 50 kilometers from the Basra gas flares to the border of Kuwait. As highlighted earlier in the presentations, <clears throat> there are solutions to repurpose gas emitted by large emitters, but now also for much smaller emitters. Some of these solutions deliver local power, others provide compressed natural gas as fuel. There are even mini and micro LNG solutions. Previously, it was difficult to implement these gas monetization projects in remote areas. Local engineering skills and infrastructure constraints prevented uh, easy delivery of such projects. Now, modern gas monetization technologies are modularized and literally come in a box with only hookup of the gas source required. Because of the standardized and modular design and industrial fabrication process, project costs are now much lower than before. However, the issue with these emission reducing technologies is how to get these imported into the countries where they are most needed. Import tariffs and red tape often create too large an impediment to implementing these technologies. Governments can help by reducing barriers to importing emission detection equipment and gas monetization modules as shown here. During my presentation, I already highlighted a number of times that governments and regulators can provide an enabling environment to reduce emissions. Penalties on emissions such as implemented in some countries are useful and necessary. However, penalties are not just a solution to obtain more government income from oil and gas operators. Governments and societies benefit a lot more if the gas is not wasted, but used. Therefore, the level of penalties is important. Specifically, these penalties should ideally be set at a level that provides sufficient motivation for oil and gas operators to stop their emissions. The approach is a balance between carrot and stick. The government can support gas monetization, for example, through legislation on third party access for infrastructure and reducing import duties on technologies as already mentioned. There's one further point to highlight. We often hear that the assessment of regulators of emissions is inaccurate, particularly if this involves remote sensing and therefore companies object to the penalties. To this, we say that oil and gas operators are responsible to measure their own emissions and have their measurements certified by third party and to provide these verified emissions data directly to the regulators. IMF proposes a very elegant solution to implement this scheme. It proposes to set fiscal penalties being based on deemed emissions, and these could be obtained by satellite data. And if oil and gas operators then think they emit less, 
they could measure their own emissions and have these certified as the basis for potential rebates on penalties based, uh, paid. Finally, I want to end where we started the discussion. Reduction of emissions is not just for climate. Many sustainable development goals benefit from these emission reductions, but in particular, energy access, health, and climate. Solutions, seldom do we find a solution that has no downsides. As most solutions for complex problems require trade-offs between short-term and long-term, between local and global, between priorities on how to spend investment monies. Here, we have presented a solution framework that is practically self-funding. The natural gas resource wasted has commercial value and a truly large value as we have shown. Moreover, the solutions are win-win-win, a win for local energy access, a win for economic development, a win for fiscal income, whether through penalties or gas sales, and a win for climate, and particularly a win for health. With that, I thank you for your attention, and we'll revert to the summary slide to invite any questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Etienne and Catherine. And uh, uh, there is a, an excellent uh, draft paper by uh, NGCC on the meeting uh, website. And I also refer you to the wider working papers that they've done on uh, particularly methane emissions, which are on the project website. So that's, uh, those are must reads. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome uh, the UN's um, high level uh, champion for climate change, uh, Dr. Mihildin has kindly joined us this, this afternoon in what is an extremely busy uh, agenda in the lead up to um, the meetings in Egypt uh, very shortly. So if we can um, turn uh, Mahmoud's um, uh, camera and um, uh, audio on, please, and uh, I invite him to uh, address the meeting. So welcome, Mahmoud. Hello. Uh, greetings, Mahmoud. I think um, we can hear you. Very good. That's a very good start. Uh, then perhaps you can get the camera on as well. That's very good. Good. And we can see you as well. Terrific. Excellent. Well, perhaps talking about energy, I'm calling from Geneva today. For some reason, there is no electricity in this room, but uh, we're using uh, the, what remains of the daylight. Uh, but uh, uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Tony Addison, for inviting me. I uh, managed to hear the concluding uh, remarks from the previous uh, presentation uh, gives me a good uh, starting point um, about the interconnectedness and interlinkages between what we are trying to do in the climate action agenda and the rest of the SDGs and what we should be expecting at uh, COP27 on matters related to energy in particular. But um, I will just start by quick uh, reminders of the state that we're in today when it comes to uh, uh, energy and the inequality of access. Uh, when we consider that uh, Africa still had the largest figure of energy poor uh, globally, uh, where more than 40% of uh, total population lack access to electricity, uh, which are around 600 uh, million people living without something that has become essential um, uh, to others. And um, when we keep talking about uh, Africa's um, uh, contribution to total emissions to be around 3%, we shouldn't be forgetting that this is coming with a huge uh, sacrifice. That was, these emissions are, are, are not there because Africans are using more uh, friendly technology to uh, environment or to the Paris Agreement is basically because of uh, extremely low production, extremely low consumption and lack of access to essential services, including um, um, electricity, as I just mentioned. And one area that just for your consideration, when you have the political economy dimensions and the dynamics in the discussion, 
why the, co the, the cause of many developing economies, including uh, African countries, not being taken seriously in negotiations, because so far, perhaps the, uh, uh, the leverage of power is very much uh, limited. The 3% uh, percent is not like the multiples of that in the case of India, and the more multiples of that in the case of China. Uh, so a vicious argument could say, especially with the talk today about uh, returns to fossil fuel um, and uh, the calls from the African Union to use uh, natural gas, uh, emulating a, a similar call from the EU after the war in the Ukraine to uh, consider um, um, more utilization of fossil fuel. Uh, that would really be dramatic and with very negative impact on emissions and very negative impact in the future because perhaps Africa can have, uh, can have a good starting point um, uh, without major need of restructuring because there is not uh, there isn't very much to restructure. Uh, and we can really start afresh with clean, green technology. And that requires three things. And um, this could be based on a recent discussion that I just had with uh, Professor Duflo, who won the Nobel Prize on her way, work in targeting um, uh, poverty, that needs finance, technology, and behavioral change. And uh, we're not seeing much of that really flowing to developing economies, including the African ones, um, with li very limited um, investments, um, um, uh, including in renewable uh, energy. And um, I think the, the recent figures are telling us that the share of renewables in the global electricity mix has grown significantly from 18% in 2000 to more than 20, uh, uh, 26% in 2019. And uh, we can see as well the impact of solar and wind uh, thanks to the advances and cost reductions uh, associated with them. But again, when we check the, uh, the share of Africa and all of that is very much uh, uh, limited. Although that we can almost look at the bright side of light and we say that uh, countries like like Egypt um, has one of the biggest uh, solar plants in the world, uh, could be number four after the ones in India and China. Um, uh, Morocco is not doing bad as well. hydrogen is being uh, taken more seriously than ever before with the six African countries leading the work on green hydrogen uh, standards and uh, uh, a country like mine, uh, Egypt, the host for COP27 has so far 16 uh, MOUs on green hydrogen, a uh, few of them are going to be uh, ready to be uh, announced with full-fledged plan and offtake agreements. So it depends really where are we trying to put the emphasis on. Um, uh, we cannot say um, a glass half full or half empty because th there are many glasses around in, uh, in developing economies and, the, and there is a great deal of inequality and discrepancy and there is lack of, uh, of funding um, um, uh, for all kind of serious um, uh, work when it comes to uh, uh, just transition. Of course, I'd like to, to mention a couple of things before I get into the uh, uh, concluding uh, remarks on what we should be expecting from COP27. Um, there is something about uh, the, the debate about uh, just transition or just transformation. The just transition, uh, it's very much there in the literature and it's basically moving from fossil to, um, to green. Uh, but the, the transformation is putting into consideration the developmental impact. And uh, one thing that came strong from Glasgow uh, last year um, um, is the, uh, the project that's still uh, a potential project in South Africa but because it's not fully realized yet and phasing out from coal, investing in renewables, looking after the impact on the local community. That could really be considered as a good uh, transformation project, not just about uh, using a technology to the other, but was mindful to the impact on local community. Uh, but that re needs really that um, uh, starting point that I had uh, building on the excellent summary of the presentation before me, 
about the interconnectedness between the different um, action that we are, um, uh, we are trying to pursue. As, as rightly mentioned, uh, if we reduce emission, that will have an impact on health and inequality, on gender and other aspects. And I would say that, um, that the sustainability at large has been suffering from a reductionist approach for it to be, to be own, uh, to, to own mainly, uh, mainly climate action and climate action to, me, uh, to mean only uh, decarbonization and uh, having a dollar sign to carbon. This kind of a reductionist approach is not useful unless you have achieved everything else. As I was telling a couple of friends um, from um, a Nordic country, if a typical African country or a typical developing economy had achieved the level, uh, standard of living and in, uh, human capital and other uh, areas of progress as you did, perhaps they can really think uh, similarly and they can really reduce the whole matter in a couple of actions related to, um, um, to climate like this. But climate action and climate agenda globally and especially in the developing economies, especially in a world that is uh, uh, changing fast, in a world that is overwhelmed by crises. And when I say uh, uh, a colleague shared with me her talking points earlier, saying, well, the world is experiencing triple crisis and the world is not really even united about with what triple crisis that we are facing. Is it climate inflation and recession or is it climate debt and inflation or is it something else? Um, uh, because we, ha we haven't seen it with this kind of uh, deglobalization and uh, deficit of trust and uh, a lack of sharing um, of, uh, of mutual concerns as we are having it today. So uh, to answer that, and I'll be very brief, um, I would um, uh, suggest that we need to follow five things coming from COP27. First, a more holistic approach to climate action. By that, you would really put the climate action agenda, not just mitigation, adaptation, um, uh, loss and damage, which so far has been lost in endless discussion, by the way. This could be another discussion. And, uh, and we have been reminded strongly with this uh, uh, file with the recent cases in Pakistan. Uh, and you add to those three uh, finance. This is basically our Paris Agreement. But a holistic approach, um, as I see it from uh, uh, COP27, is putting the whole thing, you add to that biodiversity, you add to that the rest of the SDGs. So here you can really talk about the impact of actions in the climate agenda on the rest of the SDGs. That needs not just finance, technology, and change of behavior, uh, which is a good starting point, but that needs policy coherence and effective institution in delivery. Uh, the second point that um, you may share with me, um, I assume that uh, people, especially in developing countries, have been exhausted um, and frustrated by many promises and lack of delivery, including the famous 100 billion from Copenhagen which is even if, if it is delivered and never is. And we shouldn't really say that advanced economies didn't deliver because actually some of them did. Six countries out of 10, 23 are delivering more than 100% of their fair share um, uh, and uh, for their contribution. But uh, the rest are between 5% and 70%. But the, the thing is here that even if we have the 100 billion that will not cover more than 2% of the gap for transformation. If we take the IEA reports, for instance, focusing on energy alone and the transformation required in the energy sector, not adding the rest of the, uh, of the costs associated with other actions in climate and uh, for sustainability at large. So here you will be seeing this kind of eagerness to see implementation taken seriously. So this means that we need to have a dollar sign attached to every promise. We need to have a time frame, and we need to have some sort of accountability mechanism, not uh, um, uh, across countries, but at least within countries and even within companies through their own uh, general assemblies. If a company pledges something, they need to be fully accountable to their pledges. The third area, and Tony, I was just uh, finishing a meeting with uh, DSG Amira Mohammed and colleagues as well. Uh, this is building on your excellent work on extractives. So we built on that. We have another five regional roundtables, but not this time on extractives alone, although that they were in the background. 
um, including discussion of the critical raw material that we just finished here in Geneva yesterday. But uh, we discussed um, uh, the, the role of the regional economic commissions in building pipelines of projects in mitigation adaptation to answer uh, positively the call by the GFANS, the Global Finance Alliance for Net Zero, because GFANS said, we have the money, but we don't have the project, show us the pipeline. So we're busy during the last four months working very hard. Uh, uh, presidency of the COP, along with the UN system, GFANS and the champions team based on the Marrakesh partnerships. And we have now um, uh, a decent list of projects investable owned by the countries in the different aspects of the work. A fourth uh, dimension of the work is basically about localization, which was started in Egypt, answering a very simple, perhaps a political economy question, why a country like Egypt hosts this big COP, 40,000 people to be in Sharm el-Sheikh, what's in it for us? So, and I know that there are many things um, that are, are there for Egypt to host uh, such a COP, including paying attention of things that could resonate, resonate in Egypt in the transformation, getting more investments in renewables, in um, taking matters related to recycling more seriously, in many other things, including actually changing curricula of universities and schools to put climate and sustainability as we have seen it uh, happening now. So uh, there are many positive things in investment, finance, and beyond. Um, the final thing is on finance. So I mentioned holistic approach, implementation, regional dimensions, localization. The final part is finance. So we'd expect then us to talk beyond the 100 billion. There is a very important paper that uh, the Egyptian presidency along with COP26 presidency commission next term and, um, and uh, Vera Songwe and uh, 12 uh, scholars with them and practitioners to uh, uh, share a blueprint of priorities of finance. Um, um, as you know, um, uh, financing uh, climate has been dependent on debt instruments globally and more so in developing economies. So are working hard in order to see how can we diversify this kind of reliance on debt instruments. We have some uh, good uh, instruments for debt reduction mechanisms, including swaps that work nicely in countries like Seychelles and Belize. I would add to that the, the recent case of Barbados because it's not project-based, it's KPI policy-based. Uh, there is some good suggestions for building up carbon markets, taking ESG seriously and dealing with the problems of greenwashing. And finally, how to align the, uh, the, the budgets of the state and municipalities with climate action and sustainability. So it's a, it's a very rich agenda in which you can really see aspects related to energy and mitigation and decarbonization, including the hard to abate sectors, cement, steel, and shipment very much in the forefront. But again, the encouragement here, while we are um, uh, appreciating the specialization and uh, the targeted focus uh, by the specialists, but we need to, to put all in a more holistic approach, given the kind of circumstances that the world is facing today. Over to you, Tony. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud. That is a, a very rich agenda, and I can see um, that uh, you guys on the uh, on the process leading up to COP and indeed in the meetings are going to have uh, very little sleep on the world's uh, behalf as you try to take action on all these measures. And I particularly like the um, the approach you took about bringing in finance, uh, bringing in the debt reduction side, because of course that is a another worry for the global economy of this. Uh, present time. Now, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and we already have one question in the chat, and please do feel uh, free to contribute, uh, audience, if you do wish to pose a question before we close uh, in 10 minutes' time. But the, the question that's come in is from uh, John Hicklin, and uh, John says, on the specific issue of dealing with the waste of gas, uh, and Etienne and uh, Catherine outlined that at least 7% of global gas is being wasted through flaring and venting. Uh, John asks, um, can the IMF bring its technical advice on taxing emissions into its policy advice in its annual consultations with oil and gas producers? And Etienne and, and Catherine referred to the Article 4 consultations, but no doubt there may be, may be other uh, processes that could be used as well. And then John says, could this provide a quick and practical way 
emphasis on quick and practical, to add some degree of accountability and transparency. So that's the, uh, the question. Uh, Mahmoud also may have some views on that, but we, we've learned actually from the research that Energy CC has done that not only are we wasting a lot of gas, but we're also losing a lot of public revenue because you know, that gas can actually contribute to public revenues aside from uh, uh, contributing to energy supplies. So uh, could I actually ask Mahmoud, do you have any, any views on that yourself, Mahmoud? Right. Um, well, naturally, uh, this question was uh, mainly a domain for MDBs and the World Bank uh, to, to answer through some technical assistance um, and uh, projects uh, funding uh, such activities in dealing with flaring, in dealing with um, uh, waste. And uh, we had, uh, I remember during my days at the World Bank, there were many successful projects in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in Iraq and technical assistance was provided for countries which do not uh, normally borrow from the bank, including the GCC. So there were many good examples on that. The IMF um, has entered, uh, quoting Kristalina, the MD, as a new partner in the climate agenda. And when it does that, it does that within its own mandate. At the end of the day, IMF is a place for fiscal monetary policy dealing with balance of payment, payment crises. Uh, but given the, the impact of climate and uh, through uh, exposure to uh, the balance sheet of the state and the balance of payments to climate shocks, the, the, the IMF entered this, uh, this field, um, but with an assumption to do this work with strong partnership with, uh, with agencies and organizations and institutions that may have the comparative advantage in field work. Of course, when it comes to uh, uh, using a fiscal policy, that could be a good answer to that point I mentioned earlier uh, that was raised by uh, Professor Duflou the other day about changing behavior you can change behavior through uh, many things, long term through education, cultural change, but definitely you can do it immediately through um, uh, tax um, incentives and grants and credit incentives as well. So there, is a, th there could be a consideration for that, but the, the, the good part of this, you mentioned Article 4 and Article 4 um, now is including uh, sustainability and climate action as part of the Article 4 um, uh, reviews, which is a comprehensive mandatory um, uh, exercise that has great deal of value, then I, uh, um, I know that you tackled briefly the RST, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust Fund, but this will be only for countries with program um, for, uh, with the fund. So you need to be eligible and qualified. Eligible, this means that you need to have a program with the fund. Of course, the first eligibility that you need to be a member of the fund, and this is the majority of the, all, all of the membership, actually not the majority, the membership of the UN, with the exception of three, I think. Uh, then you need to have a program with the fund that's very, uh, 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 a few countries that, that do that from time to time. And then you need to be qualified in addition to your program of the fund. So you have a standby agreement or extended finance facility. So in order to have the benefit from the RST, you need to quali be qualified for that. That qualification could really be the entry point in which some sort of soft conditionality uh, based on what kind of public policies are there in order to deal with some issues, including uh, waste, flaring, how, how to implement better. Because the minimum is basically if your country would have an NDC, the nationally determined uh, commitments and contributions of the country. So at least you can just submit it and say, I'm going to apply it. I'm not ju just going to declare it and I will not apply it. So that will be a good tool as well to incentivize the promises and the pledges and the good intention that are there in the NDCs. Thank you, Mahmoud. I mean, I think that's um, a very good statement of, of the linkages and potential there of, of um, the multilaterals. I, I'd just like to, to go back to um, Catherine and Etienne on this, um, on this point about emissions in, the, um, in the, uh, the gas and oil sectors. And one thing that you've emphasized in the work for WIDER is just what a harmful effect these emissions have on human health. So in some senses, governments are saying, well, we're getting all of this nice revenue from our oil and gas. But of course, um, the population, particularly 
because Etienne's satellite images showed the population near the facilities is very much suffering from the um, particulate matter and all the other nasties going up in the atmosphere. So in some senses, the health budget is going to have to spend more on that. So that's a bit of a, a net loss. I mean, can we think about ways in which we could help further on this issue? A country is really aware of the health damage from venting and flaring in the oil and gas sector? Well, so perhaps I could jump in here. I mean, to the point about um, John's original point about can the IMF provide transparency and through its technical advice, this is absolutely on the mark because what we set out is this four point model, which includes transparency, it includes the regulatory measures, the fiscal measures, but it also includes the gas monetization and the measurement by satellite. So the technologies that satellites are deploying for measurement is extremely important. So I think that would be very helpful. Now the point about the health impacts on the local communities, of course, but where we see again is that given that you can spot exactly where these flares are, we know exactly how much they're emitting. You can then design gas monetization technologies that capture that flare gas and provide energy access to the people. We've been hearing from Mahmoud so eloquently how many people do not have access to electricity. So this could be repurpose the gas for domestic energy supply. It could be reduce the health impacts because you've captured that. And it would be air quality. Again, that whole air quality piece, which the human health. So this is really, as we say, multiple benefits by deploying transparency, technology, regulation, and satellite monitoring through independent measurement. But Etienne, let me hand over to you. Briefly, Etienne, because I want to give the last word to Mac Hood. Yeah, very briefly. No, I, th I think I, I can just echo what, what, what was just said. I think the transparency piece is very important. People are still in denial about what emissions do, and, and there should be no reason for that denial. I mean, the impact on um, VOCs on human health and black carbon on human health are, are, are established, and, 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 and now we can measure these emissions. So the, the debate is, is, is really, I think, around more transparency on the issue. So I refer to the BBC um, reporting on the impact of uh, gas flaring emissions in, in, in Iraq. And I think it's this kind of knowledge that then spreads that I think is, 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 is helping a lot. Um, we can do more, particularly on the transparency on super emitters, and it's exactly what we aim to do. We, we try to uh, but get this population together of 200 super emitters and then we can be very focused on getting the biggest bang for the buck in terms of reducing emissions and repurposing gas that can be used for much better use than just um, going up in smoke. Thank you very much Edkin. So I'd like to give the last word to Mahmoud to give us a sort of cri de coeur, you know, as we're heading off to all of these meetings and discussions in your home country in Egypt. And can you inspire us, Mahmoud? What would your final thoughts and remarks be before you dash to your next meeting or initiative? Which is waiting for me next door, the, my next meeting. But uh, let me be super fast. First on the health and uh, development and climate and the interlinkages between them all. I think if, if this world is not reminded strongly um, after this uh, nasty experience with COVID, of the interlinkages, there is no, nothing that we can be doing more um, to remind people of the interlinkages between the health sector, the economy, and vice versa. There is going to be in one of the meetings um, at the COP a report on health and climate, establishing these interlinkages by evidence. And one thing that I found uh, reading this report, that the health sector itself in some countries is a net emitter, um, and that needs itself to be treated with and the, and, and the contribution of the health sector to global emission is no less than 3.5%. So we need to do something about the health sector itself. Of course, it takes a heavy burden in dealing with the impact on climate. If there is a disaster like what we see in Pakistan that wiped 1,500 health facilities in weeks. Um, so the health sector itself is being impacted. 
people die because of uh, the, the uh, increased um, 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 and, uh, and global warming. There is an impact on nutrition. So all of these interlinkages are very much established. And that, again, lends support to our uh, view of a holistic approach. And then, but we, for that holistic approach, we need uh, some sort of comprehensive answers. That starts and doesn't, do not end with uh, finance. And the issue of climate finance and development finance, and that could be an, an area of consideration for research. Uh, Tony, why there is this kind of unnecessary tension between the climate camp and the development camp? Why the climate finance people are not really interested in discussing development finance at the same time? Some people say because they are in fear that the issue of additionality could be compromised. But I think there could be other reasons, including some sort of bureaucratic reasons behind that. Uh, but anyway, that would be discussed as well. I think the main thing that I would be expecting from, um, um, uh, from the COP, not undermining the importance of policies or institutions or the science-based kind of approach, but if we're not going to be seeing investment, finance, and projects flowing where the mitigation and adaptation are required, we are going not to be seeing this kind of implementation that we hope for. The issue of flaring, great to be guided by satellites, great to be guided by the most important technologies. Alan Rowe the other day showed me some, some of the work that you are doing uh, on Nigeria as, as well. But if that is not going to be projectized, positively speaking here, with support of data, um, there is that uh, new um, global early warning system that the Secretary General of the UN is pushing and that should and is being done with WMO and I know that they have many partners on that this will be an, a new source of data but again we need to have this data translate them into actionable measures get the right finance and push uh, uh, through uh, the leaders and the leaders here are not necessarily politicians otherwise we'll be waiting forever to get their act together but there could be many solutions that could come from those who are in the field and exposed directly to the trouble until we get the adequate support that we're after but uh, we'll see. Um, um, Charm is going to be seeing all of these uh, participants, including political leaders, uh, corporate sector leaders, but community leaders as well, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and thought leaders, which are as important as the others, if not more, in times of crisis. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. I think you've given us a very bold statement there, an agenda for action. And uh, I thank you very much. And uh, indeed, uh, Etienne and um, Catherine for the presentations today. We've reached the top of the hour, we've gone a little bit above. So I'd like also to thank you, the audience, uh, for attending. Uh, please go to our website for the research that is behind this uh, discussion this afternoon. And there is another wider event on the 22nd of November in the DRM series. So please uh, sign up for that if you uh, if you would like to. So um, wishing everybody um, a good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are, and thank you for participating in this event. And again, thank you to the high-level champion who's now going to rush next door to his next meeting. Thank you. Bye-bye.